welcome back to Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Paul Markle, and I'm glad to be with you today. I'm glad that you've taken a moment out of your day to listen to us. Now, across the uh, the board from me, across the uh, table, uh, looking at his super giant, how, how big is that monitor, Jared? Uh, this one's 27 inches. 27 inch computer monitor Jared's got. He is, he's one happy little camper over there on the other side of the board today. Now we are coming to you from our home studio in glorious Biloxi, Mississippi. And, uh, we want to take, take a moment. We're, we're going into our, what is this? Our 18th episode we're taping right now, Jared? Yeah, it's the 18th. Okay, 18, and uh, we hope that uh, you guys enjoyed last week's expanded uh, edition of Student of the Gun Radio, and we're going to keep doing that until someone makes us stop. So <laughs> we're going to give you a full uh, two hours worth or two segments uh, worth of material. Now, don't forget about our Crossbreed Holster Contest. Uh, we are, are partnering with our uh, our good sponsors, our, our good friends at Crossbreed Holsters, and we're giving away five Super Tuck uh, Deluxe holsters over a period of five weeks. And all that you have to do to be eligible is to go to studentofthegun.com. That's right, studentofthegun.com. Over on the right side of the page, the right-hand side of the page there, you'll see a little sign-up sheet, a little uh, put your name and address here. No, we don't spam you. We don't sell your addresses to people. We don't like that either. But what we will do is is uh, each week we'll send you a, a, a what we call an e-broadcast or a weekly broadcast, and it lets you know what's going on with Student of the Gun, new TV show material, new radio show material, the uh, article of the week, if we've got any specials uh, going on that week with uh, our partners or with Student of the Gun uh, gear. We'll let you know what's going on with Student of the Gun. Now, we give away a lot of stuff. We've given away guns and holsters and uh, um we're giving away. Uh, we're going to be giving away uh, some flashlights, and anyway, we give away a lot of good stuff. Um, and if you want to be eligible, all you have to do is be an active subscriber. Now we got you guys out there. Some of you guys who think you're slicker than uh, everyone else, you get on there, you subscribe, and then you go on 24 hours later and you unsubscribe. We're smarter than that. If you unsubscribe, you're now you're no longer eligible. So. Uh, but if you want, which if you'd like to be eligible for a Super Tuck Deluxe holster, that's right, from Crossbreed Holsters, all you have to do, go to studentofthegun.com and sign up, and you will be eligible. And we pick a, a winner every week for five weeks. Now, don't forget about our good friends down in Florida, down in Cocoa, Florida, where it's probably just as hot as it is here in Biloxi, and that would be Caltech Weapons of Cocoa, Florida. Now, Caltech Weapons, you can check them out and all the cool stuff that they make at caltechweapons.com. And we would be remiss if we didn't mention our good friends over at the Firearms Radio Network. That's right. You want to check out all the gun-related shows, including Student of the Gun, uh, you can go over to Firearms Radio Network and you can check those out. Now, what do we got for you this week? Man, we're loaded this week. This uh, show, this new show, the one you're listening to, is going to go live on July 1st. So it's obviously going to be playing the entire 4th of July week. And the 4th of July falls in the middle of the week this year. So we can assume that a lot of folks are going to be out. They're going to be traveling. You're going to be golfing and boating and barbecuing and all that good stuff. And we want you to do that. You know, you can do that. Take some time off. But while you're doing that, Take a moment to consider why you are able to do that. Take a moment to consider why you are able to have that time off and why you're able to enjoy your life and the tens of thousands of Americans that came before you that sacrificed everything up to their own lives so that you could enjoy the freedoms that you still have today. So don't forget about that. Now, every week we do a student of the week, in case you this is the first time you're listening to studentofthegun.com, but every week we pick a student of the week question, and uh, generally the student of the week questions uh, come from our Facebook page, studentofthegun.com Facebook. Now, if you really hate Facebook, I know there's some Facebook haters out there, and you know I don't own stock in Facebook by any stretch of the imagination, but let's face it, it's easy to use. But if you don't like Facebook and you want to get in and you want to send us a question, you can go to info at studentofthegun.com and you can send us an email that way. But we do have a really good question this week and we want to get into it. Now, Jared, go ahead and tell us who our student of the week is this week. 
our student of the week is Tyler Easter, and he understands the escalation of force. He wants to know, if I was in a situation where I had to draw my firearm, should I first command the individual to drop the weapon or immediately begin engaging them? Uh, Tyler, that is a that is a good question, and uh, that's the reason we picked it, because I think a lot of people out there, uh, maybe recent or new uh, concealed carry people, or you don't even have to be a concealed carry person. You just have a gun that you keep at home for personal defense. And uh, unfortunately, most people, you know, their their training comes from movies or TV, and they see it on TV and the movies, and they think, oh, well, I have to yell freeze or drop it or reach for the sky or hands or whatever. Whatever your favorite movie happens to be, because you see it on, on film, and be, and hey, let's face it, how often does the does the cop or the good guy in a movie sees a bad guy engaging in bad behavior and lethal force behavior, and he just pulls out his gun and shoots him? Well, almost never, right? He always has to say something. So we think we have to say something. Now, from a strict legal aspect, and we're not talking about you know opinions; we're talking about legal. Uh, do you have to give someone commands before you engage in lethal force or deadly force? Well, the answer is no. Uh, the reason is, is because deadly force is based upon the actions of the perpetrator, the actions of the person that is attempting to harm you, not upon your actions, but upon their actions. So is it law? You know, if it is 100 percent lawful, you are in the right and you can use deadly force to protect your life or the life of someone else. You're not required to give them warnings first. There's no, now there are countries in the world where they, you have to fire. I think it's, I think Japan still requires their police officers to shoot warning shots. Crazy stuff over there. But here in the United States, you don't have to give them, you know, warnings. However, that being said, Anybody who knows Paul Markle, a student of the gun, if you've been, you know, to us, you know, with training or if you've seen our videos, our DVDs, what have you, you'll know that we do recommend that you verbalize either before or as you are engaging them. Why is that? Well, it's as simple as this. Number one, you're not so much doing it for them as much as you're doing it for you. Think about it like that. You're not doing them a favor. You're doing yourself a favor. Now, what do we say? Let's let's deal with that first. Do we say, hey, buddy, drop the weapon or hands in the air or freeze or whatever? No. We keep it simple, and a lot of schools keep it simple. We just say stop. Stop. Say it loud. Say it proud. Now, you say, well, why? what's the deal with stop? Well, number one, Regardless of what you're saying, it's a short, loud verbal command. Now, what do we know about humans? We know that you can't make noise. You can't talk unless you're breathing, right? You got to have oxygen to breathe or not to breathe, obviously to breathe. You have to have oxygen to speak, to talk, to make words. That's how human vocal cords work. What else do we know about humans when they're involved in a sudden traumatic situation? You know, you left your house. When you left your house this morning, were you planning on being in a gun battle to save your own life? Probably not. And when it comes, when it happens, it is a shock to you. It is a surprise. And a lot of people, when they're surprised or shocked, will do what? They'll hold their breath. They'll hold their breath. Now, what does your body need? What does it crave? It craves oxygen. Because when you get that adrenaline dump, you your body needs oxygenated blood. Your muscles need oxygenated blood. Well, if you're holding your breath because you got panicked or startled, it's not really helping you out, is it? No, it's not. And a lot of you guys out there, a lot of you uh, martial arts instructors, you, you black belt guys, you're nodding your head right now as you're, as you're listening to the show because you know that really is the reason behind the whole uh, – key up or in karate, you know, the yeah, or what have you. It's, it's not to make you look cool. It's to force the person to breathe, to get that oxygen flowing in the body because that's what your muscles need. Now, that is a physical standpoint. From a physical standpoint, your body needs oxygen. You yell the word stop. It forces you to breathe deeply. That's it. I mean, you yell, it forces you to breathe. Great. So now we're breathing. Now we're doing what we need to do. That's a physical standpoint. From a psychological standpoint, if you're not someone that goes around getting involved in deadly force encounters on a regular basis, and I'm going to assume that most of you do not do that, you're going to be in a state of probably 
a bit of mental disbelief. It's almost like that whole, I can't believe that this is unfolding in front of me. Now, it's going to take you a, a, a small amount of time probably to snap out of that. Now, what is that small amount of time? Is it a half second, a quarter second, two seconds, three seconds? I mean, some people never get out of it. Some people are just stuck in the disbelief as their head is being beaten off of the, the asphalt. Now, we don't want to be those people. But what you need is you need to give your, you allow your mind to command your body to do what it needs to do. And we call that a go code or a go signal. Give your, you give yourself something, some type of deliberate command that, all right, the time for watching is over. It is now time to act. And when you, you know, draw your pistol, you're, you're in the process of drawing a handgun or what have you, and you yell, stop. That is your mind giving your body verbal permission to go. That's the go code. It's, it's going from here. You know, once I yell stop, we're not, you know, we're, we're going. It's live. The dance is live. And you need that. The human body needs that, especially if you're not used to being in deadly force encounters. And I'm assuming that most of you aren't. You've got to have that. You may be in that frozen state and that yelling stop is what gets you out of it, gets you motivated and gets you moving, saving your own life. Now, there's another reason. We also want to talk about what is going on around us. A lot of people say, well, there was, there were no witnesses. Most of the time there are witnesses. Most of the time when there's an assault or something going on, there are witnesses. Now those witnesses may not come up and help you. They not be, may not be coming forward to help you, but they might be uh, turning their phones on so they can record you getting beaten to death in the parking lot and then they can, you know, post it later and give an interview to the local news. What have we seen here lately? We've seen that. We've seen that mentality in humans. Well, I won't get involved and stop the person from being beaten to death or murdered, but I'll pull my phone out and I'll record it. That That's a whole other topic, but my point is this. There generally are witnesses around. And when you yell stop, what do you tell the witness? You tell the witness that you are the victim of the crime. I don't like the word victim, but you're the defender. You're the person who is doing what they have to do to defend themselves from an unlawful assault. And if they happen to have their phone out and the video goes to the judge, there's going to be you yelling, stop the bad person continuing to do the bad stuff that they're doing. And then you, if you have to shoot them or what have you, that then that's what happened, had to happen. But you're putting yourself in that position. And the great thing about yelling the word stop versus help, rape, whatever, unfortunately, there are a lot of homo sapiens walking around out there that if they hear the word help, instead of going towards you to help, they'll look the other way because they don't want to be involved. They don't want to see it. They don't want to be involved. But if you yell the word stop, the curious George wants to know, I just heard the word stop. I don't know why. I want to look over there and see what that's all about. Uh, so you're better just yell stop. It, it does several things. Now, it in a in a perfect world, the person, the bad guy, they're they're into they're doing their bad deed. They've begun the cycle. You yell stop and show them that you ain't playing, and they might actually get a clue. They might get a clue and stop. That's great. Go team, you just won. Now, they may not. You need to understand that yelling stop might not be all it takes. You might need to do something else. But at very least, you're setting yourself up, you know, as the de facto good guy. So there's a lot of, from a legal standpoint, no. You don't have to yell stop. You don't have to issue verbal warnings from, you know, before you use lethal force. But from a practical standpoint, you're yelling stop for you. You're not doing it for their benefit. It's for your benefit. So keep that in mind. Now, one one last little uh, asterisk note there. Uh, a lot of folks, uh, uh, they, they get a chuckle when I'm on the range or when we're doing our training or we teach it. Because we teach our students and we practice when we are engaging in lethal force practice or training. That's right. We're, pra you know, practicing and training in the event that we might actually need to save our own lives from a hostile assault. Well, while we're doing that, 
we yell stop. People are like, oh, that's silly. Why would you do that? Why would you yell stop at a cardboard target? Well, here's the deal. If you can't make yourself do it in a sterile training environment, you know, in an indoor range or an outdoor range, if you can't force yourself to say the word stop, then and you think you're going to have the presence of mind in the real world to do it, you're, you're mistaken. You're kidding yourself. So get in the habit of doing what you need to do in training, and then you'll actually do that in the real world. Now, as we discussed, as we talked about, uh, this, this show is going to air over the 4th of July week. And I'm going to give you guys a homework assignment. You're like, oh, man, I knew I shouldn't have listened to him this week. Well, too bad. Professor Paul is giving you a homework assignment. You are a student of the gun. I'm going to give you a homework assignment, and it's ridiculously simple, but it's something that you need to do. Sometime during this week, sometime during the 4th of July week, and why do we celebrate the 4th of July? You know, Again, for you people who went to public school in the last 20 years, Independence Day is, the, is July 4th, and that was the day that the Continental Congress in Philadelphia presented the formal declaration of independence to the people. That's the day that it was made public. Now, historians, you guys out there who are hip to American history, will know that it was actually July 2nd that it was presented to Congress, and the Continental Congress read it and voted to approve it. And a lot of the guys in Congress at the time thought that July 2nd was going to be the day. They thought that was going to be the nation's birthday because that was the day that the Congress actually heard it. But it obviously turned out to be it was the day that it was presented to the people. And that is the July 4th, 1776. Now, you smart guys know that we were already in the middle of a shooting war at that time. Uh, Rounds were being exchanged and we were at war with Great Britain before the Declaration of Independence was written, signed, and presented. But it was that formal declaration that let us know that we weren't going back. Up to that point in time, they still, and there's a lot of people in the United States or in the colonies that still were of the opinion that we could make nice with Great Britain, and they would say, okay, we'll we'll let you back into the fold, and you make nice, and and we'll give you your rights as British colonists back. Because back then, uh, people were still considered, they still considered themselves up till, you know, 1775, 1776, to be British citizens who, you know, lived in the colonies. And it was only after the reading of the Declaration of Independence that they said, look, we're no longer going to be a part of Great Britain in any form or fashion unless we get our butts kicked here and we lose. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go ahead and read just the the first two paragraphs. I want you to hear them. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with one another and to assume among the powers of earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So before you go out and barbecue, have your golf outing, get out on your boat, watch the fireworks, I want you guys to take a moment, and if you're a dad or a mom, have your kids read the Declaration of Independence this week. All right, moving on, we've got some great news, some fantastic news that I actually just became aware of this morning as we're recording this, and that is that the charges against a West Virginia teenager uh, have been dropped. That's right. Uh, the story's been going on for a while now, but in case, you, in case you missed it, in case you were busy living your life, and uh, they, a West Virginia teenager, a 14-year-old, that's right, a 14-year-old, those of you who are parents know, you know what 14-year-olds are about. They're kids, was charged because he wore an NRA Protect Your Rights t-shirt to school. That's right. It said NRA Protect Your Rights, and underneath it, there was a picture of a camouflage-style AR-15 rifle. And uh, the story goes, he was. they commanded that he take his shirt off 
at school. One of the teachers saw the gun and was so incensed by the the picture of a gun that I, I think she ha- might have had a stroke or, or peed down her leg a little bit. But uh, this story goes from the ridiculous to the sublime. It wasn't that they just – you and if you read the story, if you read the original story – him going to school with a T-shirt that had a picture of a evil gun on it. Oh, my Lord. A picture of a gun? That wasn't against the school's policy. There was a policy against uh, obscenity and, and, you know, lewd and obscene things on T-shirts, right? You can't say bad words and show pictures of nakedness and what have you uh, on T-shirts. But there was no rule against coming to school with it. Well, they went so crazy in this school district that they called the police – and they had the kid removed from the school by police officers for what? For dealing dope, for stabbing a teacher, for smashing the windows out. Oh, no, no. For wearing a T-shirt with a picture on it. What kind of a country do we live in where we're arresting 14-year-olds? We're calling the police to take a 14-year-old away because they're wearing a T-shirt with a picture of a gun on it. And you're, if, if you have not heard about this before, you're thinking no, that, that can't be. There must have been something else. He must have been fighting. or he. Mu- no, no. His crime was wearing a shirt. Let that soak in for a little bit. Well, this it's gotten even crazier. The district attorney in this county in West Virginia, and by the way, shame on you, West Virginia. I would expect this in Massachusetts. I would expect it in California. I certainly would not expect this in the state of West Virginia. Uh, and if you're listening to me and you're in West Virginia, I hope you're hanging your head low because it's it's sick. It is literally sick and twisted that a prosecuting attorney in the state of West Virginia would feel that he should waste the taxpayer's time and money to prosecute. You know, they they decided to file charges against a 14-year-old. They charged him with obstruction of justice for refusing to change his shirt. Yes, you heard that right. Obstruction of justice. When you hear obstruction of justice, what do you think? You think um, somebody took dope and they flushed it down the toilet so the cops couldn't find it, right? Or uh, obstruction of justice, they knew somebody had committed a crime, but they concealed the evidence of that crime. No, they're going to charge this kid with obstruction of justice. Remember, keep in mind, it's a 14-year-old for refusing to change his shirt, well, this has been going on for a couple of months now, and a lot of people in the in the know uh, are familiar with it. A lot of gun people are familiar with it. Well, we finally got some good news. Apparently, uh, somebody saw the light, and a judge, Eric uh, Judge Eric O'Brien, has dismissed the charges against Jared Markham. That's right. The the fourteen uh, year old has had the obstruction of justice charges. Uh, dismissed against him finally finally they saw the light but and and we're happy about that and we're glad that that uh, this judge has stepped in and said no no we're we're not going to go any farther but while we're happy and while we're you know pleased that this has come about we should still be pretty darn disturbed you should be pretty angry and upset out there if you number one if you still have kids in a public school understand this if your kids love freedom if you teach your kids to hunt or to shoot or to respect firearms, your kids are potentially in danger because your kids are potentially free thinkers, independent thinkers. And in public school today, that you are not allowed to be an independent thinker. You are not allowed to be a free thinker. You are not allowed to express your own opinions. That is frowned upon, and you will be punished if you do so. So keep that in mind. But we wanted to uh, – we're happy, like I said – Right as we were putting together this morning's show notes, we were uh, put polishing up the show notes. We found this story, and uh, the reason we found it was because one of our our good Facebook friends they they posted it up there like, "Hey, you guys need to know that." So you guys are you're like uh you're like my little uh, field reporters out there. You're all out there uh, giving us the good news. So Jared Markham, the charges uh, against him, the charges for him wearing a T-shirt with a picture on it have been dropped. Thank the Lord. 
oh, this, what what kind of a world do we live in? What kind of a world do we live in when we're going to file charges against teenagers for wearing T-shirts? Oh, I need to take a drink of water. All right, the next topic, and uh, this happened just within the last week as we're recording this. Now, this this is the primary subject of, of this particular segment, and it's called Monsters Among Us or Why I Carry a Gun Every Day. And that's right. As I'm sitting here behind the black carbon steel student of the gun microphone, I have a crossbreed holster on, and in that crossbreed holster, I've got a car P45. Yes, I'm in my own studio. I'm not expecting trouble, but that's not the point. I don't keep a fire extinguisher in my house because I'm expecting fire. I keep it just in case. And this is why, because I don't know. It's not what I'm, I'm not worried about me or my actions. I don't know about the actions of other monsters that are living amongst us. And this story comes to us from New Jersey. Oh, New Jersey, New Jersey, how we love thee. Not really. A woman was at home with her kids. Young mother, middle of the day, you know, at just hanging out at home. Her husband's at work. She has a three-year-old daughter, and I believe it was like a 18-month-old son. And she's just doing, going about her day. And a, a monster, a two-legged vermin, enters her home and attacks her. Now, this not this isn't something that has never happened before, but what has not happened, or at least is extremely rare, is for the attack in someone's own home to be recorded or captured on video. Not just video. Usually we get security videos and it's silent, it's quiet. You know, you just see what's happening. And that doesn't really do us any good on Student of the Gun Radio to have a video where you can't hear anything. But what we have is not only video, but the audio of a young mother being attacked by a home invader in the middle of the day. And we're going to let you listen to that right now. My daughter has saw everything. <laughs> saw me get choked and hit and slapped and beaten up. I'm sure that if you're listening, that probably disturbed you. And I'm sorry, but you need to be disturbed. We need to be disturbed. We need to not just drive on with our lives and say stuff happens what you need to understand and and if you're listening to me right now i know a lot of you guys out there you're like dude i'm with you i'm i am prepared but how many of you have wives who are not how many of you have friends and relatives who don't quite get it how many of you have people who think that you're crazy because you get up in the morning dress yourself put a gun on and all the other stuff that you might need and go about your day. And you do that every single day, not because you're a policeman or a warfighter or a Marine, just because you are an armed citizen. How many of you don't tell other people that you carry every day because you don't want to be judged as crazy or paranoid? How many of you guys out there have tried to convince your wives that they need to keep a gun at hand ready and they won't do it or they keep it locked in a safe in the closet in the bedroom? There's a lot of things we can learn from this instance. And if we if we just shrug our heads or you know shrug our shoulders, shake our heads and we say, well, that's it that is terrible, but you know it it happened in New Jersey and and you know, thank goodness the woman wasn't killed. Um she wasn't killed. No, she was she was beaten. She was beaten severely. She uh had bruises and and fractures and stitches and he, he, unfortunately uh, what what I know uh, from being a police officer and having spent a lot of time as a professional bodyguard is when people are victims of attacks, victims of violent crime, the long after the physical scars have healed, long after the physical injuries have gone away, the bruises are gone, you know, the, the soreness is gone, long after that, the mental scars still remain. People still feel victimized. They're still scared. They still wake up in the middle of the night. They still can't sleep. They still see it happening over and over again. The emotional scars of an attack like this will stay with you much longer than the physical scars. And it's not, it's not even just so much about the fact that you were attacked. Well, I'll give you a good example. 
physical damage. Hey, Jared, can you hear me over there on the other side of your giant monitor? Yeah, I can hear you. Now, have you been in fights where you took serious, brutal physical damage? I've taken some brutal damage before. Yeah. Have you have you have you doled out some brutal damage as well? Uh, I I have done that as well. So uh, Jared has both been on the receiving end and on the the giving end. It's it's much more enjoyable to be on the giving end than it is the <laughs> receiving end. Exactly, but. Uh, do you do you still wake up in a cold sweat, in a panic, in the middle of the night, uh, thinking about the uh, that day that you were uh, that your face was bloodied and your nose was broken? No, I kind of got over it quickly. Why is that? Because I was fighting back. Because he was fighting back. Now, Jared is a professional fighter. He has fought uh, MMA. But the point that I'm making is this. You know, as an MMA fighter and, you know, professional fighters sustain a lot of physical damage. They dole out a lot of physical damage as well, but they don't have mental and emotional scars. Why is that? Well, it's because they weren't the victim. They were participating in their own defense. Now, I understand that it's, don't save your letters. Okay. Don't, don't tell me, oh, it's the same thing. Here's what I'm telling you. If you are an active participant in your own defense, you will you will fare much better from an emotional standpoint than if you are a complete and total victim. This is what the people in the Brady campaign and, and all the ones that want you to just surrender all of your guns and let the government take care of you. This is something that they either don't understand or just don't care about is the fact that when a person fights back, even if you lose, even if you lose the fight, the fact that you fought back is a mental bolster. It emboldens you. It helps you survive. And I'm telling you this, if nothing else, fight back. Fight back as hard as you possibly can because the only other, other option is to just lay there and take it. And even if you say, well, but if I lay there and take it or, you know, if, if I tell my daughters if they're ever raped to not fight back because the person will get angry and hurt them worse. First of all, if you tell your daughters not to fight back to just take it and be a good witness, you're a horrible person. And I, and I don't want you to listen to my show. As a matter of fact, I'm going to, Jared, write, write this date down. If you've ever told your college daughter not to fight back and just be a good witness against a rapist, you are forbidden to listen to this show ever again, and I better not catch you ever listening. Okay, but moving on, fight back. Now, what lessons did we learn or can we potentially learn from this horrible, unjustifiable, completely unjustifiable assault on a young mother in New Jersey? Well, number one, and I've said it already, this is why I wear a gun when I, every when I'm awake. If I'm conscious and awake and moving around, I have a firearm attached to my body because that is the best place to secure it. It is secured on my body. I always know where it is. I never have to worry, are the kids getting into it? Is someone going to find it? The only way someone's going to find it is if they find it on my body. So I have it. The guns locked in saves in your closet, in your master bedroom, are not for personal defense. Yes, you should secure your firearms from unauthorized access. I'm not telling you not to do that. But what I am telling you is that locking a gun in a safe in your bedroom, just in case you need it, is not a guarantee. Yes, maybe you'll hear the bad guy coming and you'll flee to the room and get it. That has happened. I understand that. But that is not a guarantee. You're rolling the dice. You're hoping that you'll have enough time to get from wherever you are. You're in your kitchen fixing lunch. A guy smashes through the back door. Hang on a second, bro. Let me run upstairs to my bedroom, key the safe, put my fingers on it, do whatever I have to do. I'll get the gun and I'll come down and deal with you. All right? Can we do that? No, that's not how it works. Uh, make sure you have, we talked about this in the four D's. That was it two weeks ago, Jared. I think it was, uh, the four D's of defense is uh, delay, deter, defend, and so forth. Detect. You need to layer your home defense. If the first time you, and we talked about this, like I said, if the first time you realize that there's a bad person in your home is when they're standing over you, pummeling you in the face, that's, you're pretty far behind the curve. You need to layer your defense. Lock your doors even when you're at home in the middle of the day. 
They're like, wow, what are you crazy? What are you paranoid? How much extra effort does it take to actually flip the deadbolt over while you're walking, while you're inside your house? Really, how much extra effort does that take? Now, conversely, if a bad guy makes it all the way up to your front door and the deadbolt is down, they're going to have to do one of two things. They're going to either beat on the door, pound on the door, smash the door. They're going to have to do something to get inside. It's not going to be quiet. They're not going to just be able to open the door, walk in, and start pummeling you. Layer your defense. Dogs. Dogs are awesome. Even in, And I'm not saying you got to have a Rottweiler, a pit bull. Uh, I'm not saying a German Shepherd, uh, although those are all good dogs. What I'm saying is some type of something else, a four legged barking machine that when people come on the porch starts going bananas and barking and going crazy. Because at very least, number one, it lets the bad guy know, oh, crap, the dog's inside barking. The humans have been alerted. And that's what the dog's job is. The dog's job is to alert you. Hey, human, something's going on outside. I hear it. You need to deal with it. Okay. What do we know about cameras? All the folks out there, how many times have we heard after a school shooting or after this or after that, after a, some crime, well, we need more cameras. We need more security cameras. That's what we need. We're going to spend $10,000 installing brand new security cameras in the local elementary school or high school or whatever. Dudes and dudettes, listen. Cameras do not provide security. Cameras are for monitoring. Cameras are so people can watch you being beat to death, beaten to death after it happened. Cameras do not protect you. Do we understand that? Lord in heaven, I get tired of having to say that, but I keep hearing it over and over again. Oh, we need more security cameras. No, we don't. What we need is more armed good guys. We need more armed and determined fighters in the world. We don't need more cameras. Cameras do not stop crime. Cameras record crime. And what what do we see here based on this instance? It's the same thing that we hear over and over and over again. Bad person harms good person. Bad person gets away. Police have pictures of bad person. Police hunt for bad person. Maybe they find bad person. Maybe they don't. As I'm recording this, I'm not aware uh, that this person has been captured. Jared, have we have we seen a uh, an update? Has this bad guy been captured? I haven't seen one. Uh, I haven't either. Now, maybe by the time you hear this, that might have happened. But what do we know? We know that this monster for no reason other than he's just a monster and don't try and read you know put your own reasoning onto this guy don't try and well I'm, no there are evil people in the world step 1 accept that step 2 figure out how you're going to deal with evil but what happens this guy you know he goes in and thank god he didn't rape or murder this woman but he beat her severely and she's going to be mentally scarred for years to come I'll put the the YouTube link up on the uh, studentofthegunradio.com for you guys. Go watch it. And if it doesn't make you fume out your ears, then you have no heart. You have no soul. Yeah. And this, so this guy, but he did that and he's still on the loose. That means other people's wives are potential victims. Other people's wives are in jeopardy because this guy is still out there. That's what happens when you put all of your faith in. In government, when you say, well, I don't need to have a gun because Joe Biden convinced me that it's the police job. Uh, um, Nanny Bloomberg convinced me that I don't need to be an active participant in my own defense, that that's the police job. Well, where were the police? Why weren't they parked in her driveway? Oh, that's right. I forgot. It's not the police department's job to be your individual and personal bodyguard. They're not required to, and they can't do it. So what do we know about this instance? Well, number one, we know that there are monsters among us. You can't sterilize the world. It's impossible. But there are things that you can do. And if if you've heard this, if you've seen it, if you're aware of it, you need to take. And after I saw this, I made sure that all of my children watched the video and my wife just to and, and they're pretty hip. But just to reinforce the fact that, hey, you don't know what's going to happen today. You need to be ready 
just like having a fire extinguisher. I don't have a fire extinguisher in my kitchen because I want there to be a fire or I'm planning on there being a fire. It's there because just in case. Why do you have a gun on, Paul? Are you paranoid? Are you looking for a fight? No, it's there just in case. And I tell you what, if my kitchen was on fire, I'd rather have the extinguisher than not. If some monster enters my home and decides that just because they're going to attack and brutally beat my wife, I would rather she had a gun than to not have it. And cameras and security systems, what do we talk about in the four Ds? The last one is defend. You need something. After all those other things have failed, you got to have something because if you're putting your faith and reliance upon security cameras at some point in time, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Now stick with us. We've got the uh, the second hour coming up. The second hour, we're going to talk about black rifle basics. We're going to talk about a banger police chief who accidentally put a bullet into himself. And we're going to talk about some shoot, no shoot scenarios. 